Uh, how big do you think his influence has changed the environment of the pharmaceutical industry? Uh, unfortunately, a lot. <laughs> um, one person's actions should not be influencing a whole industry's procedures and policies, but it, it, it has, unfortunately for me. I think people, you know, drug companies still price drugs at high prices, but they're a little more wary to do so. And certainly repricing has, has basically all but vanished. Uh, you'd have to be insane to reprice a drug now, even though it was common practice in the past. And like I said, it was sort of beneficial, uh, as weird as it sounds, uh, it was sort of a beneficial practice because you tended to get a lot of uh, attention on a disease, you got to get better supply chain, you got to get better virtually everything, uh, profits certainly for the drug company that could be reinvested uh, into further drugs. All of that was sort of pretty good, I think. And now you, you sort of have taken that away, or at least I in some ways have taken that away, which is really unfortunate because there are still plenty of drugs like that gallstones drug I mentioned earlier that are at risk of being discontinued or at risk of uh, stock outs or whatever, or just need more research uh, that profits do provide an incentive for. So it's it's a shame. And I, I kind of regret uh, giving the, the the drug industry yet another black eye because it has plenty of black eyes from things like uh, uh, erectile dysfunction uh, to uh, ADHD overprescribing to certainly the opioid crisis. The drug industry has, has a lot of sins. Um, and I think, you know, adding to that list was not something I'm proud of. Uh, even though, you know, I, I, I support the drug industry, I support capitalism, I support what I did, I still am not happy that it's had this impact. Um, I think that, you know, uh, it's a shame, you know, it's, it's, it's an industry that's uh, contributed greatly to reducing uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, to reducing uh, oncology, you know, and cancer sort of outcomes or improving them, I should say. Uh, pretty dramatically in the case of diseases like CML, multiple myeloma, not Hodgkin's lymphoma, even some cancers, uh, solid tumor cancers like lung cancer. Um, really, a lot of people I know that, that wouldn't be here uh, without uh, the drug industry, especially for rare diseases like cystic fibrosis and spinal muscular atrophy, which used to be uniformly fatal, and now both are uh, easily more easily treated. So really a great industry. I mean, what industry can you say does that? You know, uh, certainly not the media industry, which tends to point a finger at everybody, and certainly not um, the food industry, which uh, doesn't really care too much about nutrition. <laughs> uh, you know, you have a lot of industries with a lot of sort of bigger targets, in my opinion, should be on their back than pharma. Um, of course, pharma doesn't get everything right. Um, but in general, it's, it's, I think, a pretty good industry. I'm a pretty honest person. Uh, and I still believe that, you know, with science, uh, can come really great um, strides in, in, in helping people. Um, again, not perfect industry, but but pretty close to it, if you ask me. So anyway, uh, I do think farm has changed a lot because of my actions. Um, you know, I don't think that's a good thing. I think it's a defensive, closed-minded reaction. Um, it hasn't changed that much, though, with respect to like, well, people are still researching medicines for <laughs> important diseases. Of course, you know, that that's not changed. I'm, that'll never change. But, you know, whether or not people can be non-traditional, I think you've, you've seen kind of this more woke kind of like we have to be careful what we do and say, because look what happened to Shkreli. That That is certainly something I've noticed, you know, um, which, again, is, is, is a shame because, you know, the farm industry should have room for younger people, in my case, uh, people who sometimes say and do dumb things, uh, which happens in every industry. And right now it's sort of this very like careful industry because it's, it's, it's a very profitable business. And with that, those profits kind of comes this weird social responsibility, which I don't think, you know, I guess that's one controversial thing I think I'll, I'll say is that I don't think companies have too much social responsibility. Um, and that's something that um, Vivek Ramaswamy also says, uh, who's a pharma, sort of a pharma, young pharma entrepreneur. Um, and he's railed against it in his book, Woke Inc. Uh, and I think most of that social responsibility that companies sort of pretend and act like they care uh, is, is mostly just little checks that they write out in press releases when pharma actually does care. Uh, they make drugs by spending billions of dollars and change outcomes by, by increasing people's livelihood or their, their ability to survive a terrible illness. That's real change. and That's real community, uh, you know, uh, benefit as opposed to sort of the woke Kind of like, well, we were there, you know, we wrote a $100,000 check when George Floyd died. That's not going to change anything. Uh, at least the problem that you think is a problem, uh, you know, that's not going to fix that. That's not going to fix racism in America, um, if you believe that that's the problem. 
uh, but people wrote those checks anyway, um, regardless, because it's, if you don't, you know, you're not, you know, you're sort of, you know, uh, potentially at risk for not having done that. <laughs> you know? So there's all this kind of woke BS that happens that, again, you may believe that the George Floyd situation and racism in America is extremely important. Perhaps you do. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but writing the check, you know, at that time, for that reason, to me is sort of a, you know, it's sort of virtual signaling that that doesn't actually change the problem. And, and I don't, I think those companies admit that, right, that they know that, you know, they're not going to fix racism with a check. Uh, so why do it? Well, it's to show them that, let's get, say, in the case of Starbucks or whatever, that their brand stands for something, that their brand stands for against this injustice. But what does coffee have to do with <laughs> with racism? You know, it doesn't make much sense to me. Um, yeah, I agree. Yeah. And so, you know, you, you tend to see that kind of thing increasingly happening where, you know, companies are posturing for what, you know, what they want to be sort of perceived of and absolved for. And, and you see this a lot with United Healthcare, which is the biggest insurance company in healthcare, which sort of perplexes me because United is kind of a dirty business and they've made themselves into somehow one of the most respected companies, according to these surveys. And one of the reasons is they do a lot of these donations. Anytime something bad happens, United Healthcare is the first with a check, but the checks are not, are not huge uh, and their profits are, <laughs> you know? So it's sort of like really sneaky to me to do stuff like that. Uh, it's nice to support, you know, communities with your profits, but, you know, it's also sort of disingenuous if, if you're sort of covering up for a business you're not proud of uh, in the first place, or you think people can assault that business uh, so that, you know, you're, you're sort of making up for it by writing these checks. So I don't know. To me, it's very, it's a very weird thing that, that there's this corporate sort of benevolence and corporate gifting that, you know, when did this become the job of, of companies? Uh, I, I don't like it very much. Okay. Uh, yeah. My quick question is, I think about a month ago, uh, I was on Destiny's, I was, I was watching Destiny's stream. You went on there and, you know, it seemed like you completely kind of nuked that bridge with Destiny and Destiny nuked that bridge with you. Uh, do you feel like you reacted too viscerally at the time, too emotionally? Because uh, from my perspective, Destiny was just covering the news. He wasn't giving his opinion on the you know, what people thought was a rug pull at the time. Um, so do you feel like you were too defensive going into that? And do you regret doing that too, or no? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, you know, Destiny isn't somebody I've ever met. Um, I don't know a whole lot about him. He kind of showed up, like, almost immediately after I got out of prison. Like, the first day that I started streaming, he uh, hit me up to, like, do a Google call. And then he didn't tell me, I was like, yeah, sure, dude, whatever. And he didn't tell me that he was streaming that call to everybody, to his, to his followers. And I'm like, wow, that's really sneaky. Um, he just kind of strikes me. And again, I don't know him from a hole in the wall, but like the couple of times that I have talked to him, like he just kind of strikes me as somebody who's like very aggressive in sort of getting viewers, keeping viewers, doing anything to sort of do that and serve like his own interests, which I think is, uh, you know, he was clearly disingenuous about, you know, the, the sort of hack that I went through. And it really hurt me that somebody that had interviewed me a bunch of times, including times where I didn't exactly even inter agree to the interview. Um, like I've given this guy content for free. Um, and, uh, we seem to have had a good relationship. Like the first stream we had, we had a pretty good vibe. And like this guy just kind of like, you know, instead of like potentially coming to my rescue, right? That's what a friend would do is like, Hey, I know Martin. I talked to him. I've seen the evidence. He's right. You know, that would have been nice. Um, but instead the guy kind of like, you know, you don't do that to somebody, you know, I expect somebody who doesn't know you, like somebody on CNN or Bloomberg, for instance, they said, Oh, Shkreli's token appears to have sold off and it appears this and that. Okay, cool. You know, they're Bloomberg. That's their job. He he's supposed to, be my friend to some extent, right? Uh, we've, we've exchanged a lot of pleasantries. So for him to sort of just do that, and he also has access to me, right? He has immediate access to me. Anytime he wants to ask me a question, he can ask me a question. So I was just hurt, you know, I guess I thought our relationship was something that it wasn't. And it's cool that, you know, that's the way he wants to treat it. But I'd say, you know, whatever, I, I'm, you know, I, I, I think that in terms of the way I acted, so like, I, I couldn't care less about him or, or what he does from, from here on out. 
but I thought I had a relationship with sort of a somewhat prominent Twitch streamer. But in terms of my own reaction, I, I, I think it was probably a mix of me trying to show just how personal a business can be. You know, if you pour your heart, your blood, sweat, tears, your soul into a company, and you've done that, you know what it's like to start a company. It's really hard. Uh, most companies fail. And I poured everything I have into drug like over the last few months. And it's a successful site. The product works. It's a really great product. We tried really hard to make it work. And uh, it's a huge engineering challenge. And we've risen to the occasion. And to sort of like have this like doubt cast on you from somebody you know, we have enough haters from people I don't know, but from somebody that you, you know, to sort of like not be on your side, not just be on your side, but kind of like suggest that you know, you're being dishonest or something like that in a situation where it's just clearly not the case, you know, it's really just hurtful and difficult. Even this guy, Muta, who has a big YouTube channel, you know, he started off with the same question and then he was, he was willing to listen to me, delete his old YouTube, make a new YouTube that where he would, he agreed with me and still be able to sort of preserve his authenticity and his content. And I think like, the mark of somebody truly dumb or truly stupid or ignorant is somebody who's refuses to change their mind under new evidence. You know, we all as humans have a Bayesian problem, right? We see something, it's really hard to incorporate new information. That's sort of just difficult for people in general, but to have it to the turned up to the point where you just won't consider new information or you won't sort of like react and like be like, well, yeah, no, it's, it's clear this this guy is right. Like is and and I was even willing to like reveal these really embarrassing details, like the the video I clicked. Like it was not easy for me to admit that. Like it was yeah. you know, would have been much better off, you know, not admitting that. But I had to admit it if I wanted to be honest. And I think it was as honest as it gets. And Destiny's sort of mindset was like, well, that doesn't prove that you didn't hack yourself. And it's like, well, I can show you even more proof. And for Muta, it was enough. Um, so anyway, it really bothered me and, and it was, uh, just something that like, I don't know, to, to the extent you want to call somebody on the internet, your friend, like, I think like there's a certain way to act as a friend and there's a way to act as an enemy. And I think he acted like an enemy, oh, you know, I, I'm yeah. willing to sue anybody that is willing to state on the record that they think that mm -hmm. I intentionally damaged my own company because I know that I didn't. Yeah. And the nice thing about lawsuits is as much as people don't like them. The nice thing about lawsuits is the truth comes out in the lawsuit. You get discovery okay. and through the discovery process, there's this ability to show documents and to show evidence. And mm -hmm. I can, to, to prove defamation, you have to prove that in fact, what he's saying is not true and that he, he is lying. So if I was destiny, I wouldn't yeah. be willing to state that for a fact. I would be willing to backpedal and say, well, I'm not saying for sure, which is kind of what he started at. And now he's sort yeah. of backpedaled. And to me, that's that's very like chicken. I'll use a euphemism here, kind of chicken behavior, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Oh no, no, I'm just bringing. Well, why is it interesting? The whole world brought up the possibility. You you were sort of willing to say that that's what happened, and and the, you know I'm willing to go after anybody because I know the truth. You also went out the way to contact all the authorities, and you also wrote like a thirty page document or something. So yeah, we did yeah. a lot of work. Just, yeah. Yeah. But, but anyway, know, uh, thanks for your time. No, anytime. I do wonder what this portrayal publicly in the media has done to your like business relationships, both present, past, and potentially future, and your personal relationships. Like, how has that actually affected you? Yeah, I mean, I'd say like 80 80 percent of the time, it's it's sort of a negative for business, and then twenty percent of the time, it's a positive where people specifically they maybe they wouldn't have heard of me otherwise or. They specifically think that, you know, what I did or, or was, was okay, not just okay, but also maybe a smart thing to do, or they, you know, they, they learned about a lot of my other business successes, whatever the case may be. But generally it's, it's a negative thing. Obviously people don't want to affiliate or associate with me. Uh, personally, I'd say it was it's sort of a net positive, like it helped me sort of realize maybe who, who people, who, who are the people who are my friends outside of uh, just being my friend for what I could bring to them because what I could bring to them sort of declined uh, due to the first question, right? More and more people were not proud to sort of be affiliated with me or whatever. So so the people that were sort of my friends were, were made a little more clear to me uh, because they, were, they weren't there for just, you know, just what I could give them. Uh, the other benefit obviously was that, you know, I got to meet more people and uh, there's some benefits of, of fame that are probably somewhat obvious.
I wonder now that you're out and that you've had time to reflect on all of this that if you would have done anything different. Yeah, I mean, I generally do agree with your your premise there, as did my attorney, Ben uh, Brafman, who is probably one of the most famous defense attorneys ever. Um, he, he felt that way. And I, I'd sort of take his opinion over my own, which is I'm probably, he's certain of that. I'm, I'm a little less certain than he is, but I think you're generally right. Um, in terms of doing things differently, I mean, I, I tend not to like kind of look backwards and, and, and regret. I'll certainly try to look backwards and learn. Um, I, I had a sort of pretty particular set of circumstances there where, where what I did, uh, you know, I, I might have sort of had to do in a lot of ways, but I, again, it's, it's hard to look backwards. I, I mean, maybe I can look back and say my world, my life would have been better off if I never met that drug. And that's probably true after the fact, but, you know, it's easy to look back after the fact of things. Uh, uh, looking at, uh, you know, looking at it sort of, you know, at the time, could I have engaged in a different thought process that would have led me to better decision making or something like that? You know, again, it's, it's sort of all like uh, retroscope uh, <laughs> and uh, retrospective and difficult to sort of uh, say for sure. So I, I, I don't know how to answer questions like that. It's like very tricky. Like I get you. It is a very broad question, yeah, but I'm glad to hear that you're like coming out of all of this enterprise that you are still like a positive, like outlooking person. And that, yeah, like, yeah. given all the crazy turmoil that you still seem like you got your level head on you and everything. So what exactly happened with you and how did you and this drug like uh, get, get on the radar? Uh, how do we sort of come to buy it? Uh, now, how did the media find out about it? Oh, well, um, good question. Yeah, so basically there is, well, a couple different ways. I mean, I, I'd say that there are always kind of like people within an organization or adjacent to an organization that sort of want to, I don't know if there's a better word for just inform or rat or whatever on what you're doing. And so if somebody especially feels like, you know, somebody's done something wrong, they'll kind of whistleblow, if you will, um, and tell a reporter and sort of pitch a reporter a story. And people will do this without any tangible benefit to themselves. Uh, they'll do it because they think it's the right thing to do, or they don't like somebody, or what have you. And when you have a company with, with hundreds of people in it and invest, lots of investors, even people who are incentivized not to say anything will, will sort of talk about it. So that's what's sort of one thing that, that'll happen all the time. Even Trump's own people would be leaking right to the to the Washington Post, New York Times, and uh, he was always fixated on who's leaking. I, I think one should fixate instead on like, well, what are you doing that merits the leak? But uh, you don't want your people leaking, but it makes you question yourself as to, you know, what kind of uh, people are you hiring and what kind of things are you doing that are so bad that people want to leak them. So there's that. But there's also like publicly available lists of drug prices. That's not it's not a secret. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I don't know exactly who sort of came up with this story and decided that they wanted to, to sort of uh, make it make people aware of it. But you know, it was going to end up sort of happening one way or the other. You can't hide a, a drug price change. Uh, that's true, but I'm just a bit confused because drug companies buy and sell drugs from different companies all the time. And in a way, they kind of get away with it, but it's a completely different story with you and your company. Yeah, I mean, at the time there was a, it was a political year in the sense that the presidential election was underway, and um, it's funny because I had a <laughs> I had a friend in the Obama administration, and I said, "Gee, you know, I was under fire for all this stuff," and I called my friend and I said, "Gee, you know, I haven't heard Obama or Biden say a single thing about me." He said, yeah, Martin, they don't have an election to win. <laughs> you know, because they already had back-to-back -back <laughs> terms. And he said, they don't care. I, I talk to those guys all the time. I was in the White House two weeks ago. They, they know that the market will correct itself. They'll be a generic. They'll be whatever. Like, there's a lot of systems in place to stop that. But the whole gist of politics mm -hmm. is if you can take, and, and I think there are people, uh, I use a name that a lot of people have a visceral reaction to, but there, there are people like Hitler which I don't mean to compare our current politicians to him, but there are people like that, that that have mastered the ability of making a boogeyman, right? And like, if you can create a boogeyman, I think Hitler did it with Jews and um, 
you know, politicians do it all the time with other groups of people. If you can make a person so scary and so bad that you want to rally around this politician to stop that person, that's a lot more powerful than saying, well, this is my platform on taxes. This is my platform on... That sounds like something you want to donate to. That sounds like something you want to, you might want to vote for. You know, it's a lot easier your job to win the election when you can have straw people like that that you prop up to, to fight and to beat. You know, that's like, you know, politics 101. Of course, I don't know anything about politics 101, <laughs> you know, but uh, over the years, that, that's something I, I realized that when you could put a face on something, the face of corporate greed in America, as Martin Shkreli, the face of whatever, uh, you know, is something that you can, like, you can think of the face of invading your privacy. Who did everybody just think of? They probably thought of Mark Zuckerberg. The face of, you know, I can pick another one, but you can't pick on, like, the oil industry, for example, the, the, the face of monopolizing uh, and, and drilling for oil at really high prices. You probably couldn't think of a face. So there's something that, like, is really important about being able to put a face on something and, and it just galvanizes somebody much more easily than uh, without it. So I think that's kind of, uh, you know, the answer to that one. Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so how do you go about buying these copyright patents to these dogs anyway? Do you just go up to these companies and ask them or? Yeah, yeah, that's more or less it. I mean, uh, there's an M&A department at most companies, so we had a pretty good one uh mergers and acquisitions and you know you're just hunting for good acquisition opportunities and you look for ones that would be profitable and make sense and that the seller wants to sell the buyer wants to buy and occasionally a deal will happen probably one out of every 20 or 30 deals that you think of actually happen and sometimes they're related to price sometimes they're related to expanding into a new geography sometimes it's about something really subtle about the drug or clinical opportunity and you know, just you kind of just look and look and look to try to create value for your stockholders, and you know that's sort of the primary motive there. Um, you know, other companies will say that their motive is something else, but really that's the main motive that drives a company at the end of the day.